it's less than 15 of living in Nazi Germany. It's the 15th of June, two 15s, one after the other. Uh, so today's lesson is about women. And what I intend to do today is first of all, do the bad YouTube thing where I look down at the keyboard whilst I sort out which screen I'm going to share. And then secondly, to share the screen. Here it is. Um, I've got to stop saying um randomly. That, that, that is irritating. I don't know how you feel, but I feel awful. Here are two images. And if you open up the PowerPoint that's attached to show my homework, this will be your first uh, slide. What I intend for you to do with this slide is to print it off in color if you can, and if you can't, don't worry, and label these two images. One of them is from Nazi Germany, the other one isn't. Both of them show women. If you're gonna play along and do this properly, you'll print these out, cut them out, stick them into a book, uh, preferably your uh, exercise book, preferably in the middle of a page each. So you'd need a double page spread or one page either side. A double page spread will be best because then you can compare them directly. And in the middle of each page, you have one of these images. Then you're gonna label them over what they tell us about women in the period in which they're from. So if I flip forwards, you'll see what I mean. Here's one, here's the other, and here's the question and task. So if you're gonna play along, print them off, stick them into the books, use the smaller versions, that gives you more space for the labels. And the task is this, what do these sources suggest about the qualities of the women depicted in them? Based on that answer, what, when do you think each one was made? How does your own knowledge help you to understand them? If you're gonna play along, you're gonna to have to pause the video at this point and go ahead and do that. In a lesson, it would take about the amount of time that would be taken to go through a register, and then a little bit longer. However, this is at home, you can take as long as you wish. So, pause the video. I'm going to assume that you have paused the video as long as you needed to. I'm also going to assume that you've labeled your own labels. This is important. You don't go through the answers until you've done your version. That way you can build what you did into the answers that I explain. That doesn't make my answers right or your answers wrong. This is history. They all count provided you've explained them. I'm just gonna point out things you may have seen or may not have seen. Now, first and foremost, when were they made? Based on your answers, this should be blindingly obvious. The one on the left is clearly from before the Nazi era. That is clearly a woman not living under Nazi rule. You may have found multiple reasons why, but it is clearly not Nazi. The one on the right is obviously a Nazi thing. The, the, the giveaway is up here, and we'll talk about that more in a moment. But Let's go through each image in turn and see what we can do. He says, oh, my labels started, but I did not spot them. The first thing I wanna point out actually before I do the labels is the background here, the color. The color is red and the subject of this portrait was uh, a woman called Anita Berber. Anita, A-N-I-T-A, -A, Berber, B-E-R-B-E-R. -E -E Anita Berber was her stage name. She is actually, well, I'll come on to this in a moment. This was a portrait she commissioned. It was her favorite portrait of herself. And it's one that she presumably had hanging in her own house. So she liked it. And now you're like, sir, it just looks awful. That's fine. She liked it. And I'm gonna explain why. Uh, the red, by the way, is there for two reasons. What does red represent in art? Several of you have said things like anger. True. Some of you will have been more perceptive and realize that, yeah, it does actually, do anger, the, the red mist and red is as blood, but red is also about passion and that's why it's associated with anger as well. In this case, it's a sensuality and, and a passion of a different sort. Uh, I'll give you the clues as to why this is. Now, I apologize to any parents watching. This cuts right to the quick. So please bear with me whilst I academically go through why this is important in terms of attitudes to women and how women lived and then discuss how that shows the Nazis brought change or social revolution, they would call it, to the role of women in Germany. The first thing I want to talk about is the size of the hands. You probably noticed that they're enormous. And the interesting thing about this hand in particular is that she's smoking. Even today, we have an issue with women doing things that men do all the time. And women smoking and men smoking have very different connotations. In 1920s Germany, this was Weimar Germany, before the 1930s, Women smoking was seen as decadent and wrong. 
Men were perfectly acceptable. It was fine for them to smoke. Women, if they were smoking, well, they should smoke sensuously. They should smoke with one of those weird things that holds a cigarette at the end. I forget what they're called. Um, and it should be done to be alluring. Now, the way that Anita Berber is holding the cigarette is far from alluring, and deliberately so. This is not about the male gaze. Every man and boy in the audience are looking at that going, Ugh. and most women are looking at this too. Uh, the, the ladies amongst you are also looking at that going, I don't, I don't get it. Um, this was not about you. It was not about the viewer. It was about her confidence, and she wanted to draw attention to herself. Now, she is sat in a very, very uncomfortable pose. Or is she? More on that in a moment. The next thing I want to talk about is the hands themselves. They are deliberately huge. She had mannish hands, and she was very, very proud of her mannish hands, and proud of the fact that that made her androgynous. That is, neither male nor female. Not both, neither. And she was also proud of the fact she had incredibly long fingers. I'm sorry to have to do this. Can you work out why she was proud of long fingers? She was famously bisexual. And again, she wanted to put that in the portrait in a way that was signaled to those in the know, but not immediately obvious. This is in the 1920s. I don't think you get away with that in modern portraiture. portraiture. So to get away with it in the 1920s tells you something about society and women's roles. She is certainly challenging in her portrait, but consider how much more challenging it is to us now than perhaps it was in the 1920s. The fact that she could get the portrait made and no one complained, or rather the complaints were there, tells us something that I think even now no one would make a portrait like this, meaning that we are less far along with societal challenges than we were in the 1920s, or Germany was in the 1920s. The next thing to point out is the fact she's drinking. She's drinking a cocktail. And if you look carefully at that, that is not a cocktail she has made. She is out. She is not at home. And again, in the 1920s, this was a big deal. They'd just come out of the 1800s, and in the 1800s, women, especially unmarried women, were not allowed out without a chaperone. Now, if you look carefully at those hands again, there's no wedding ring. She is single. She wants you to know she's single. And she wants you to know she's wearing a red jewel. Uh, again, this idea of passion and sensuality. Um, and, and she's out. She's at a club. She's at a place that does cocktails. She is, well, late at night at a place that does cocktails. You can draw the, the links yourself. You can figure this one out. The other thing to point out is she's at a cocktail table. This is not her table. She's in that club. And you can see she's got, uh, well, several accoutrements there. The next thing is the haircut. That is not a female haircut. She's wearing a hair short and it's parted. It's a male haircut. This again points towards the androgyny. She is proud of the fact that she is neither male nor female instantly in appearance and she's kind of flaunting that. If you look at other images and other photographs of Anita Berber, her hair is far from male and if you look at her generally in photographs, she tends to look fairly feminine. In this particular portrait, she is therefore very deliberately accentuating her androgynous qualities, which tells you something about what she was trying to do with it. She is challenging you, the viewer, and I would argue that she is doing a very good job. Very few people are able to look at this and stay comfortable. The next thing is she's wearing a monocle, another male affectation, and again, it's this blurring of the lines. She can do anything a man can do. It's equality. And even now we struggle with that. Even now feminism is a, a force in our world. And even now people say, oh, I don't see what the point of feminism is. Whilst also being rather mean to women. Even women do this. And I find it fascinating. You look at the makeup she isn't wearing around her eyes. You look at the fact that she's not styling her hair in a long style. Ladies, consider your own. Very few of you will have short hair, and of course you do that out of personal choice. It's not at all to do with the fact that literally everybody in our society expects women to have long hair and wear makeup. Not at all. It's your personal choice. I understand this. And gentlemen, the reason you don't wear makeup or have long hair is absolutely your personal choice and nothing at all to do with our society and our views on males and females. Again, we find this portrait challenging even today. But she's wearing some makeup. She's wearing lipstick. That's important. Also, there's the way she sat. I don't know if you've noticed. There's something not right there. This is not her smiling. 
this is not her enjoying the music or even enjoying a drink. There's something else going on with this facial expression, but the makeup being thick red lipstick is important. I shan't explain that one to you, I'm afraid. You'll have to figure it out yourselves. Uh, she's got matches. No one's needed to light her cigarette. Usually in films, and certainly in the 1920s, in most sources, where women have a cigarette, it is lit for them by a man with a match. The book of matches here was very deliberate because she didn't need anyone to come and light her cigarettes for her. She did it herself. And again, this is a challenge to the social mores and ideas of the time. That facial expression half-lidded, mouth open, she's tired. Why is she tired? What has she been doing? What's going on here? When, uh, to most people in films and jokes and societal constructs, have a cigarette. Yeah. She's been engaged in um, physical acts of intimacy. And she's in public. She did not do this at home. There's the proof. She didn't even pull her stockings up properly afterwards. Remember, she's proud of this portrait. This is something she wants to show. And you begin to understand why this is challenging and why even now we find this difficult to look at. Now, for the 1920s, this was challenging, but it tells us something about the freedom to be a woman in the 1920s. She is able to set her own sexuality. She is able to flaunt that sexuality. A couple of things you need to know about Anita Berber. Anita Berber previously turned up on that uh, attempt that I had with a music and images starter. It didn't quite work. I hope it worked for you. If it didn't, I apologize. But Anita Berber was a dancer, she was a singer, she was at the Tingle Tangle Club, no really, that was its name, and it was kind of a, a cabaret show, so she often, not quite stripper, but close, she, she danced, danced in very little. This is at the time of the 1920s, people were kissing in the streets, damn it, and she was one of those that were pushing those boundaries, so she would be part of those that had the asymmetric hemline with the dress, so that it looked like you've just thrown it on, you just had sex, the overly sexualized vision of a female, so she would have rouged her knees, ask your parents, and she wants to flaunt the fact that's what she's done, that's why she's sat so awkwardly, it's why she looks the way she looks, it's what she wants you, the viewer, to be aware of. She hasn't gone out with a chaperone. Um, famously, she would uh, take people to a room, and if she didn't enjoy the experience, she would charge them for it. Some nights, therefore, I guess she was a prostitute. Other nights, she just slept around. Yeah, if she didn't enjoy the experience, she charged for it, and if she enjoyed it, she didn't. End of. And she said that was her freedom to do so. Now, I'm not sure what you think about that, but the fact that that was challenging in the 1920s tells you something about society in the 1920s and tells you something about what it was to be a woman in the 1920s and how free you were as a woman in the 1920s. Freer than perhaps we are in our society. I say we, I'm not a woman, as far as you know. So make of that what you will. That's the 1920s. That's Weimar Germany. Remember when I said that a lot of Germans didn't like Weimar Germany and enough of them didn't like it enough that they supported the Nazis instead? Maybe this portrait begins to explain why that is the case. Moving on to the second image, which is obviously from Nazi Germany, there's the crucial detail. It's the uh, Nazi youth, uh, NJ, Nazi Jugend, and therefore you begin to understand what the Nazis want for women. Now this image, is perhaps less challenging. You look at this, and the only real challenging thing here in our society is that she's breastfeeding a child. And a lot of people in our society would find that challenging because they say, well, it's a woman's choice, and not everyone should be forced into feeling guilty that they haven't breastfed their child. The science on this, I'm not going to go into. My own research, I'm a man, I don't get to present that. Sorry, uh, ask your parents, I guess. So, the Nazis, even a stop clock is right twice a day. Uh, 
damn right once, I guess. Uh, not about that. The first thing I want to draw your attention to is the head. You might have got this already. There's a halo effect going on here. This is a very deliberate appeal to religious values. Not religion. The Nazis don't care about the church. They, they absolutely hate the idea of Christianity and they're not fans of Catholicism either. But what they do know is that most people uh, understand and have seen religious iconography. The idea of a halo uh, shining out is innocence and purity and it's powerful. It raises people above the normal, not well, hoi polloi, it raises people to new levels of piety and purity. So the idea of having a halo is very deliberate because it's trying to show a purity, not just of purpose, not just of attitude, but a purity in another way too. And I'll come up to that in a moment. So there's purity going on here and some kind of specialness about women. In the background, you've got a man on a field. If you look carefully at that, uh, the, um, what do you call it? silhouette it's very clearly a male silhouette with a horse he is working on the field it's this volkish idea working in the countryside uh, the volksgemeinschaft the volkish idea the non-city based living and obviously the man works in the field and the implication therefore is the woman is not working she stays at home where is she staying at home she's staying at home to look after the child and here is the child looking at her breast and that's her duty. Look where she's looking. Look at her eye line. Look at her, her viewing. She is focused entirely on the needs of the baby. And the baby, in turn, is focused entirely on her as a means of survival. This is the perfect female vision for the Nazis. The other thing in the background is a church. Uh, this links to a Nazi idea of Kinder Kirche uh, Kuchen. Uh, be careful with that one, right? Uh, if you get it wrong, uh, it means something else. Kinder Kirche Kucker, uh, Kirche meaning church, Kinder meaning child, Kucker meaning kitchen. Uh, otherwise, you end up with Kinder Kirche Kuchen, uh, which is children, cherries, and cake. And to be fair, I prefer the second one personally. Anywho, that's what's going on here. It's this idea of the, 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 the church. Now, again, the Nazis are not religious. Why stress the church? They stress the church because it was socially the right thing to do. People turned up to church to be seen at church, to wear their Sunday best, to show their respectability by doing the right things. Usually at this point, I give an anecdote, so I'm going to do it right now. So to explain this vision of going to church as being not about religion, but actually about doing the right thing, I had an argument with my grandparents once. I'm a terrible person. Uh, my grandparents, uh, very famously, were complaining. Uh, I say very famously, famously in my family, famously to me, because I remember it. And they were complaining about their vicar, and they said, oh, it's terrible what our vicar's done. And I'd been working for a shop that sold Bibles, and we used to get a lot of people coming in, uh, and they'd say things like, I'd like the real Bible, please. And I'd say, well, all of our Bibles are corporeal. You may have any of them. And they said, no, 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 no. You know what I mean. I want the proper one. I went, well, they're all proper. Uh, and they went, no, 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 the original Bible. Like, wow, you read ancient Greek and Aramaic. I'll have a look. I'll see if I've got one. And I'd make a great show of going and saying, well, we've got the ancient Greek one. I've got the Latin Vulgate. And I know that's not what they're after. Like, no, 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 no. I just, I just want the, the real Bible. And like, they're all real. Like, look, you can hold them, touch them. They're real. What they wanted was the King James Bible. So my point is, I was being deliberately obtuse. With my grandparents, I kind of figured where they were going. So I was being deliberately obtuse. I am a horrible person, I've said this, so let me just reiterate that. And they said, well, he's changed the Lord's Prayer. So, oh, really? Well, how's he changed it? Because that, you know, is terrible in a religious uh, situation. If you're changing prayers taught by Jesus Christ, you, you're, you're guilty of, like, well, what's the word? Um, being a heathen, there's a word for it. Heresy. You're guilty of heresy. You can get burned at the stake for that. So that's terrible. What, what's, what's he changed it from? Well, he's, he's changed it from the original. And herein comes my deliberately obtuse moment. And I was like, oh, you know Aramaic? Because Jesus spoke Aramaic. And they went, no, 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 don't talk daft. He's changed it. I was like, oh, okay, I'll bite. How has he changed it? He said, well, he's changed it to, to uh, our Father, you are in heaven. Sounds to me like the Lord's Prayer. I said, but I knew where they were going. So, well, that sounds to me like the Lord's Prayer. That's a proper English translation of the Aramaic. If we don't know Aramaic or ancient Greek, pretty good translation. 
And they went, no, 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 that's, that's ridiculous. The, the Lord's Prayer goes, Our Father, thou art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses. And I'm like, well, that's great, but it's 1611 English based on the King James Version of the Bible, which, by the way, is what most people call a proper Bible. And they said, well, it shouldn't change it. And that's just the way it's done. That's, that's what being a Christian is. I said, is it? So, so you're a Christian then? I said, so you believe a, a man died and three days later came back to life and floated into heaven on a cloud. You believe this? And they said, don't talk rot. That doesn't happen. Now, that being the basic premise of Christianity, that Jesus Christ died and rose again and, and in so doing dealt with our sins. That's Christianity. If you don't believe that, you're not a Christian. So I said, well, if you don't believe that, you're not a Christian. So how dare you? I go to church every Sunday. And there you have it. Churchgoers, people who go to church to show socially they're doing the right thing, to be seen by their neighbours, to turn up and show their respectability, I suppose. So the Nazis are not Christians at all. They hate Christianity. The concept of turning the other cheek and, and not fighting back and murdering everything, it's not a Nazi thing. They're all about strength. They're all about power. The Christian concept of forgiveness is alien to them. They're all about hate and racism. I mean, you might say the same about some Christians. That's fair enough. But Christianity in its conception is all about tolerance and forgiveness. And if you think someone's doing wrong, you forgive them. How many times should I forgive them, my Lord? Said Peter to Jebus. And Jebus responded, 70 times seven. And then again. So, pfft, yeah, no, it's, it's not really a Christian thing to support a Nazi or to be Nazis. So people say, oh, the Nazis are Christian. No, they're not. They push the church as a form of respectability, as a return to those traditional values, those family values that we talked about earlier. So that's what that church is about in the background, and that's why it's important, it's in the poster. The next thing to point out is the fact, and I don't think you can see this on the version you've got because the video quality is appalling, there's a very slight tan line. And the reason I point that out is she is not taking off her dress regularly. She does not go outside very often. The tan line shows she stays modest and demure and she stays indoors a lot and so you can see it when she's breastfeeding a child because it's just along this line here I don't know if you can make it out it's not very clear on this poster and I apologize it's clear on all the sources but the other sources don't necessarily carry as many things as this one does which is why I chose this one so the tan line is there also while we're on it her face doesn't have makeup it is pure it is unadorned unadulterated it's her face. On that basis, the Nazis are actually putting forward quite a body positive view. Uh, weird, but true. The idea that women don't need makeup. I know it's a fascinating idea. You, of course, need makeup. How else would you hide your spots? Apart from the fact that most foundations actually um, cause spots and block up the pores in the first place. Anyway, by the by, the point is the Nazis are suggesting that women don't need makeup and that putting on makeup is lying which in itself is a misogynistic point so okay they started good then they ended on an awful note then the nazis what do we expect uh, she's got undyed hair and it's blonde we can guess that she's blue-eyed this is about racial purity as much as it's about moral purity because of course it is speaking of which you've got uh the aryan features i forgot oh yeah the uh, the eye line i was pointing to our eye line looking at the child we already covered that um so this arrow is about her face being not made up etc this arrow is to the blue of the dress now the iconography of religion is the virgin mary the mother of jesus christ the perfect pure virgin untouched unsullied was always dressed in blue in the catholic faith why? Well, blue was hard to get hold of, uh, lapis lazuli, and so it was a, a means of showing honour. But it got turned around, and now there's this idea that Mary wore blue. Whether or not she did, entirely irrelevant. It's associated. Most Germans at the time would have associated that instantly with the Virgin Mary, and instantly with the point that she is pure, unsullied, demure, does as she's told, quietly endures all. That's how it goes. Read the story sometime in Luke, I think it is, uh, of the birth of Jesus, and you'll see that basically she doesn't do much. Uh, the birth seems to go off without her so much of a whimper, and Jebus is thrust upon the world 
um, what's the him? Uh, no crying he makes. I, I, I call absolute, yeah, no, not a chance. That baby made a noise. But that's the view, and that's how it goes. Oh, sorry. Go back. Thank you. So you've got these two views, and straight away, you can see that there is a massive difference between these two images and what the view of women were. So why do I share the one about Anita Berber on, wait, no, this side? No, no, there, over the far side. Why do I share that view first? You don't need to know that, but without knowing it, how can you explain how the Nazis changed lives for women? How can you explain how much the Nazis changed lives for women? And how can you explain what the Nazis were actually after? Otherwise, it just weirdly pops out of nowhere. The second one on this side again, I guess, I guess they're both on that side, but yeah, the second one shows you what the Nazis were after. I guess the question becomes, to what extent did they achieve this? To help you with this, I'll take away my face. Always a good idea. Women in the Third Reich, women. Two questions. What did the Nazis want from women and how successful were their policies? Did they actually achieve it? Now, there are two strands that we're going to try and cover. And the third slide on the PowerPoint you've got in Show My Homework and also on the one that I'm talking you through here is designed to help you go through the notes that I'm about to take you through. Now, you can just write down the stuff as it appears. That would be perfectly acceptable. But as you can see here, there are several questions that break down what we're trying to do and hopefully make it easier for you to focus on the different bits I'm talking about. And if necessary, ask questions in the comments if I don't cover those answers to your satisfaction. I warmly encourage people to uh, message me about those sorts of things. It's what I do. So the first lesson, lesson 15, will be going through these. You'll notice there's an extra task on here doesn't appear anywhere else, asking you to use the circular sent schools in Hessen on the 15th of April 1935, and it, it's practicing using the provenance, uh, where the source is from, in order to make it useful. Obviously, you've got to use the source content to back up the provenance, the proof Nancy. So that's why that's there. I won't tarry too long here. You, you, you've got this for yourselves, uh, and we can move on. So, women in the Third Reich. I shall probably put my face back on because I always find it easier to see someone's face and the facial expressions they make. Sometimes it helps you to understand what's coming next. So, not terribly well animated, I apologise, the entire box turns up. Nazis, women, and the family. The Nazis are big believers in family values. Question, what does that actually mean? If you're going to play along, pause the video, have some ideas. Pause. Okay, I'm going to assume you've had some ideas, you've talked to someone who you want to torture about Nazis, they're probably getting used to it by now because of all the different tasks I said. And you've come up with several ideas. They are all equally valid. Does it mean having an undivorced married couple as your parents? Probably. Does it mean loving one another? Probably. Does it mean having a single family who loves their children? Probably. Does it mean uh, taking turns in doing the washing up? Probably. Does it mean looking after your siblings? Probably. Does it mean living with your grandparents? Probably. The point is, I can answer probably to literally anything you can come up with for the meaning of family values. It is an empty term into which you pour whatever it is you want that term to believe. And it's crucial to Nazi policies precisely because it's empty and because no one's not going to support it. Do you support family values? The answer is always yes. Who's not going to support family values? Who's going to say, actually, I don't support family values. I think families are evil. Well, apart from, you know, the, the very, very far left. Yeah, very far left, that way, uh, of the uber communists who might say you don't need families and therefore everything should be run by the state. Apart from them, most people are going to say they support family values. But the Nazis had a very specific meaning in mind. They had very clearly a male, a female, married, with children. For the married part, they were less hot on. I'll come on to that in a moment. The reason for this, there was an importance on being brought up as Nazis. Remember that term, Gleichschaltung, making everything Nazi? Well, a family was to be co-opted into Gleichschaltung to make everything Nazi, to make it impossible to be anything but a Nazi. And if you've got two parents who are trying to raise their children as Nazis, then those children will grow up as Nazis. Don't believe me, consider your own points of view and your own ideas. Up until about the age of 18, and probably even after that, 
anything you've not had to analyze for yourself, anything you've not been challenged on, you will have the points of view that were given to you by your parents. Of course you will. It has not been challenged. If nothing has come along to change them, why would you think anything other than good motives from your parents? Most people go through their entire lives with some areas of their lives that they never challenge. I know I do. So the order in which I do the washing up, no, seriously, I learned from my parents. You do the cups first, and then you do little plates, and then the bigger plates, and you build them up so they all stack, because we didn't have a drainer at home. We, we weren't exactly a, a rich family, so you, you build it up, and then you do the glasses. You always do the glasses first, actually, because they're glassware, so if there's anything in the water, that's bad. So you do those first before you put anything else in, but having said that, the cutlery has to go in first so it can soak. That's where you're going to get the uh, ground on uh, food and muck. The plates then go in after you've done the glasses. The glasses go at the back of the draining board. You get my point. Now, I'm sure you do the washing up differently. Some of you will have dishwashers for a start. And, well, probably most of you come to think of it. The point is, this is a value I've never had challenged, nor have need to challenge, and therefore I've kept it as far as I have. Family values, making all things Nazi, like Shelton, raising your children as Nazis, you are more likely to stay Nazi. So the Nazis are very, very keen on families being racially pure and also ideologically pure. There was also a need to have pure children. The Nazis knew that Germany's population was growing and it was growing faster than most of the European nations when the Nazis took control. Now the Nazis decided that to breed out their enemies, remember they were great believers in race, you had to have more children than they did. And there was a belief that non-white people were having children at a faster rate and Jews were having children at a faster rate than the well non-Jewish non-black population nothing really changes right so you had to breed them out also the Nazis believe in Lebensraum remember that idea of expansion and taking land away from the east so you had to have a lot of children to do that to justify the stealing of the land Women, therefore, were encouraged with a three-word phrase, or I suppose four if you can, und, uh, Kinder, Kirche, and Kuchen. I think Kuchen is kitchen. Check with your German teacher. It might be Kuchen. One of them is kitchen. The other one is cake. Welcome to German. Uh, it's this folkish idea that the woman stays at home, looks after the children. Uh, you may think that your children are kind, but German children are always Kinder. It doesn't really work when you say that out loud. It works better as a written joke. Yeah, never mind. And you go to church to show your respectability. This is the idea that women don't adorn themselves, that women are um, pure in their makeup and so on and so forth, or lack of makeup. Speaking of, they're encouraged to dress simply. Formless dresses, not, not figure-hugging clothes, not to show off their attributes for want of a better phrase. They were not to put themselves under the male gaze. They were to be, well, pure. Uh, which I guess is also the male gaze, but also not to wear makeup to trick males into thinking they were more healthy or better looking than they were. Because apparently that's what makeup does, it, it tricks males. Mm. Uh, I don't wear makeup, I really don't know. I mean, can you imagine these eyebrows? I'm going off the point. Hitler said that women were equal, but different. Sounds pretty good. What did Hitler actually mean by that? Well, mainly he wanted, how did he put it in 1922? Um, bitches were there to breed. Yeah, those are the terms he used. Sorry, um, I guess that's what he meant by equal but different. Huh. Anywho, propaganda raised the status of mothers. And here you have that post that we started with very clearly. Remember, this is a, a Nazi youth poster. It's designed to be put to 10 year olds. It's designed to give them something to aim for, to, to be something for them. And, and at 10 year olds, I'm just gonna reiterate that. You're being told that your focus in life as a woman is to have children. Boy children will become soldiers. Girl children will have more children. That's how it works. Uh, nevertheless, there was something in this. You go through the circular, it was sent to schools in Hessen. So this is for school children. It was deliberately bringing in that educational aspect. That's why I do youth first, so you know where this comes in. It says, this year, like last, the German people will once more express their commitment to the German mother. I expect schools to remind young people of their debt of gratitude to their mothers with dignified celebrations. Can you imagine if we did that? If we asked you to have gratitude to the person that looks after you at home, specifically the female person that looks after you at home. 
for the vast majority of you, I imagine you'd see that as a positive, and why wouldn't you it is? Can you imagine if schools did that deliberately? We don't really do it very much. And that's very, very big on this. So were children the main function for Nazi women? Well, kind of. One of the first things the Nazis do is they ban abortions. So you can't get rid of children once you're pregnant. Now, the morality of this is still debated. And I notice it's become a cultural issue in the UK today, which I find bizarre. Uh, we haven't really talked about it as a culture since the 1960s, when we made abortions not only legal, but easier to get hold of. And frankly, I'm all on the camp of it's a woman's right to choose. If you don't like abortions, I guess don't have one. Um, I personally will never have an abortion. People will. I'm not going to judge them for it, for I am not them. And I'd much rather did it safely, you know? So if people have to, or feel they have to have an abortion, I'd much rather they did it surrounded by doctors and the medical science so they don't die, uh, or, you know, irreparably damage themselves. Don't know about you, the morality can go out the window at that point. Some people are going to do it anyway, I'd rather they did it safely. Nazis, on the other hand, no, you must have your children, because children are important for Lebensraum. More children, more population. So they ban abortion. It's a standard feature if people want large, increasing populations. It's a very right-wing thing to do. It also means that women are shackled, for want of a better phrase, to that child. You have to kind of look after it. When a sprog pops, you're kind of stuck. Um, I've got three, trust me, I know. And birth control being banned meant that you can't sort of take precautions. Uh, yes, condoms existed at this point, but they were reusable and had to be washed every time. Um, you could, of course, use a lambskin condom. Uh, apparently, it's more comfortable. I wouldn't know. Uh, but less, obviously, effective because, yeah, you've got to wrap it around. There's no real airtight seal there. The point being, the Nazis banned them. So it's more likely that women would have babies if you had sex. And as we just discussed with Anita Berber, women were having sex. I hate to break that to you. Your parents probably did too. Probably after you did. Sorry about that. Right now, your grandparents are probably doing it. Sorry. Um, ew. In 1933, they passed a law for the encouragement of marriages. How did they do this? Well, here he is. It's just flashed up at the bottom. It's down here. People of German nationality who marry one another can, on application, be granted a marriage loan of up to 1,000 Reichsmarks. What does that equate to? Well, a house probably costs around 3,000 Reichsmarks. So that's a pretty significant amount of cash right there. If you didn't have any children, then you had to pay the loan back. It is a loan. If you had one child, you had to pay back the loan had two, then it dropped to 800 Reichsmarks or 500 Reichsmarks, depending on the time when we're talking about. More than three children, and you didn't have to pay it back. There is a definite financial incentive to have more than two children. Why more than two? Two is steady state. You replace yourselves when you're dead. Three means that you're increasing the population. Um, so these marriage loans were reduced due to the number of children born. And if you didn't think that was enough, you could also get medals. There was something called the Motherhood Cross. Uh, if you got 12 or eight children, then you got the Motherhood Cross with extra leaves. And that was amazing. It rewards childbirth. There was a gold Motherhood Cross for eight children, a silver Motherhood Cross for six, and a bronze Motherhood Cross for four. Clearly, they wanted people to have a lot of babies. The Motherhood Cross, by the way, had the same standing in society as an iron cross the highest level of bravery in the German army. So men could aspire to an iron cross, women could aspire to the motherhood cross. But what if you were single? What if, through no fault of your own, you were a good German woman with good racial background and you wanted to have children for the Nazis, but you were unable to find a man because all the best men were in the army and you couldn't meet them because they're in the barracks. Well, for you ladies, they were Lebensborns. And the idea behind this was you went to an SS barracks, remember, they're the racial elite. They are blonde haired, blue eyed, perfect Aryans. And you chose one that was good for you. They impregnated you. And then you went home and had the child. And that child was a Sonnenkinder, a child of the sun. And you raised them as a good Nazi. Yeah. That was a thing. That was a thing. I don't know what else to say to you uh, because anything I say now, you'll probably write down and 
No one will thank me for that. So the Lebensborns, children for single women, as long as you're racially pure. Success? Well, by 1939, the birth rate had increased by 25%. So that meant for every four children that were being born in 1933, there were five children being born in 1939. So the birth rate's gone up. However, you'll notice the next sentence says, is that support for the Nazis, i.e. people doing as they are told, I say people, women doing as they are told, or is it simply economic? One thing this, uh, we found recently with the 2008 economic crash and I suppose during coronavirus, when things are economically comfortable, people tend to have more children and when they're not, people have less. This makes sense. If you're under uh, economic straits and financial difficulties, you're probably not going to have a child. You're not going to bring them into the world because you're not certain they're going to be well looked after and they're your child and, and you want the best for them. Whereas when things are economically comfortable, you're going to have that child you've been putting off because you feel that you can give them the life they deserve. So the birth rate increased. Is that down to the Nazis increasing the economy? More on that in a later lesson. Or is it simply because they support the Nazis more? 50-50, possibly more. It doesn't really matter what the answer is. Probably the economy, by the way. What matters is you can put that in an essay and argue both sides before reaching a conclusion. I don't really mind which one you come up with. It doesn't really matter. Both of them are equally valid for a year 11 essay. I know you're only in year 10, but you get the point. In a GCSE essay, that would be a better term. Either will work. There's one final point I want to make on this about Nazis women in the family. There is one other avenue open for women, and that's the NSF, the National Socialist and Frauen. You don't ever need to spell that out, just call it the NSF. Uh, Frauen means Mrs. or married woman. Uh, and it was the Nazi organization for women. Women. I suppose there was a bureau, there was an office that ran it, and women that joined the NSF could join the bureau. They could do office work, they could do high level strategic organization, and they could have a bit of power in society. For women, this is one of the few career paths the Nazis left open. So it makes sense that most women join the NSF. And women joining the NSF doesn't necessarily make them Nazi. I mean, it does, but it doesn't mean that they joined because they were Nazis. It means they joined because they wanted to do something other than the drudgery of housework, you know, cooking, cleaning, looking after a small child. This is the only other option they've got. In particular, it's good for people in the countryside, countryside, because they can't get out the countryside any other way. And a woman who wants to make something in her life well, she'll join the NSF, because then she gets to go to the city. Sorry for the West Country accent, it was atrocious. But you get the idea. The, the, the theory was they trained housewives. They, they trained them on how to darn socks, cook meals, uh, keep an eye on their children, look after their husband. But they had 2.3 million members. And you are not telling me that 2.3 million women were in it solely to learn how to be better doormats. Some of those women were in it because it was literally the only option they had. The other thing they did was they collected for things like the Nazi charity, the Winter Hilsberg. Uh, I've mentioned them before. This is the one pot supper thing, the, uh, the, the way they go out and they collect money for disadvantaged Germans. Um, and that's very keen on that last word. Just call it the WHW. Please don't worry about it. Um, it's an earlier lesson. The spelling lurks on one of those posts. I think it's the one on propaganda. But the Winter Hilsberg or WHW, just, it's fine. Um, it's just the interconnectedness of things. It's another example to throw up the page. All of which brings me to women and encouragement. Uh, encouragement? Employment. Uh, women are encouraged to leave work. Why? So they can have children. How do the Nazis encourage women to leave work beyond the mother cross? I mean, who wouldn't do it just for the, the medal, honestly? Female civil servants were sacked during the, uh, the civil service decree of April the 6th in 1933. They got rid of Jews. They also got rid of women. I think I mentioned that at the time. That was way back, what, lesson four, I think. By 1936, there were no women lawyers or judges, which implies before then there were. That means that Weimar Germany and early Nazi Germany is actually far more advanced than you think, and arguably at least as advanced as our society is when it comes to women and employment. Now, one thing the Nazis said was, if a woman was not in work, she didn't count as being unemployed. After all, they want you home being a housewife. 
So simply not counting women as unemployed cut those figures to a huge degree. Uh, I wrote massively here because it fit the word and it didn't take a new line. It's not the greatest word to use, but it cut the figures because women didn't count anymore, nor did Jews, but that's a story for another time. However, as the Nazis were improving their economy, more about this later, and they industrialized more, they ran out of workers. So they needed more. Now the Nazis were not yet at war, so they couldn't use slave labor. Furthermore, they weren't exactly the most popular group in the world, so they couldn't sort of rely on immigration. After all, the Nazis hated immigration. They wanted a pure German race. So where do you get your extra workers from? Those children that have been born so far have to grow up. There's gonna be at least another 16 years before they can get into the factories. So what do you do? Well, it's simple. The Nazis in 1937 asked women to do a duty year. That is before they became wives, after they got married, before they became mothers, they take one year to work in industry, to pay their debt as it were, to the Nazi state. What was the result of this? By 1939, there were more women in work than there had been when the Nazis took power. And in the Second World War, women found themselves torn between roles. The Nazis encouraged everybody to work in the factories to keep the state fighting, to provide the weapons and the materiel. But they also continued to encourage women to stay home and look after children and raise the next generation of soldiers and mothers. So if you're a good Nazi woman, which did the state want you to do, mother or worker? And it's interesting, the Nazi state never get round to making a decision on what they want. This leads us to the conclusions here. This leads us to the notion that when you're asked how far did the Nazis or how successful were Nazi policies towards women, which is a pretty popular question, there are only two popular, answer, uh, popular only two potential and possible answers. Believe it or not, you cannot go with the, oh, they were successful, but they also weren't answer because that won't work. The only two conclusions you can draw is that the Nazi policies to women were confused, i.e. they did not know what they wanted, they could not make their minds up because of situations, they wanted them to be mothers but they also needed them in the factories, they couldn't do both, I mean what are you going to do? Bring your breastfeeding child to the, the factory machines? It's probably not a good idea. Or, your other option is, they utterly failed. So you don't get to say the Nazis were successful. I'm sorry, they weren't. When it came to women, they either didn't know what they wanted or they failed because they did know what they wanted. They wanted women at home looking after children and they ended up with more women in work. So they failed. So those are your options, sorry. And that is women in the Third Reich. And that, whoops a daisy, I haven't turned the video on. And that is lesson 15. Hopefully, that has made sense to you. Hopefully those notes are useful to you. Lesson 16 will also carry a video. Uh, you'll see it linked in the show my home one. You'll have known this before you got to this point in the video. So if you have been, thank you very much for watching. You shall see me in the next video and have a lovely day, year 10. I probably won't be able to catch up with most of you with history over the next few weeks, but we'll see what we can do. Enjoy your day. Hopefully the notes make sense. Do comment um, and uh, awkward pause.